book reading of uh, the book Jesus Our De Destiny by written by the author Wilhelm Busch. Uh, this is the chapter called uh, Religion is Religion a Private Affair? Is religion a private affair? Most people think so. Are they right? Does Christianity in particular have something private about it? Or to put the question more clearly, does the Christian's faith concern himself only? Before answering, I'm going to ask you a very simple question. What do you see engraved on coins? An image or an inscription? Both, of course. Every coin is two sides. So does the Christian faith. If the Christian faith is authentic and alive, it has two sides to it. There is strictly a personal, private side, and there is a public, open side. If one of these aspects is missing, there is something dubious about it. Let us now consider these two aspects of genuine faith. The personal aspect. To illustrate this, I am going to tell you a story. Someone once told me that I was just a storyteller. I replied, there is nothing wrong with that. I am always afraid of seeing people drop off to sleep in church, so if I tell a little story from time to time, it keeps them awake. Anyway, our whole life is made up of experiences, not of theories. A preacher by the name of uh, Johann Heinrich Volkening lived in the region of Ravensburg in the 19th century. This man of God was behind a very powerful revival movement. The whole area around the city of Bielefeld was completely transformed as a result of his preaching. One evening, Volkening was called to the bedside of a wealthy farmer who owned a very large farm and was known as an honest and hard-working man, but he had a very strong dislike of, ev of evangelistic meetings. The fact was, the man was unwilling to admit he was a sinner and couldn't understand why he needed a savior. His motto in life was, do what is right and shame the devil. As I said, one evening, Volkening was called to his bedside. The old farmer was dying and he wanted to take communion one last time. So Falkening went to the farm. He was a tall man and his sparkling blue eyes attracted people's attention. Come up, coming up to the dying man's bed, he looked at him for a long time without saying a word. Finally, he spoke, Heinrich, I'm worried. I'm very worried about you. The road you've been traveling on so far doesn't lead to heaven. It leads straight to hell. Then Falkening turned around and walked out. The farmer, hot with anger, yelled after him, And you are supposed to be a preacher, and you dare to preach about, about the love of God? Night fell, but the poor farmer, who was seriously ill, couldn't get a wink of sleep. His conscience was tormenting him. You are not on the way to heaven, but to hell. What if, after all, it were true? Numerous sins he had committed flooded his memory. He had not honored God as he ought to have done. At times he had managed to deceive others in a very sly, sly way. As one night after another slipped by, the deadly fear took hold of the whole being, of his whole being. He couldn't find no rest. He came to realize that he had committed a multitude of sins throughout his life, and that he had absolutely no grounds for assuming that he was a child of God. He got to the point where he longed to make an about an about turn, a U turn in his life. So three days later, he called his wife and said, "Go and get Falkening." It was late at night, but Falkenin came immediately. The old farmer said to him in an anxious tone, Pastor, I think it's high time for me to change my life. Yes, replied Falkenin. As we get older, we get wiser, but hasty repentance isn't necessarily a true one. You need something deeper than that. Once again, the preacher turned on his heels and stumped out the house. Once again, the farmer flew into a rage. Wouldn't you have been angry too? <laughs> Wouldn't it have been better for Falkenin to be kinder to the farmer? After all, uh, the man was at death's door, but Falkening lived very close to God, so he knew what he was doing. Three days later, the old farmer was in agony, in deep despair. He knew his days were numbered. He asked himself, what places have been in my life for love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, meekness, and self-discipline? His whole life through, he had despised the Savior who had died for him. Every time God in his love had spoken to him, he had turned him down. And now here he was, on the brink of hell. Desperate, he implored his wife, Go and get the minister. No, she replied, I won't go anymore. I w it won't be any use anyway. Please, he implored her, please go and get him. I am on my way to hell. So off she went. When Falkening arrived, he found a man who had grasped the meaning of this passage in the Bible. Do not be deceived, God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. 
He brought his chair up to the bed and said, You're going straight to hell, aren't you? Yes, was her reply. I'm going to hell. Volkenigstone became imploring. Heinrich, he said, Let's go together to Calvary. That's where Jesus died for you. Then he went on to explain with compassion how Jesus go, goes about saving a sinner. First of all, we ourselves must become aware of our sinful condition. Then we have to stop repeating our favorite motto in life, and we have to stick to the bare facts. Then, only then, can Jesus grant us his salvation. At last the farmer understood, Jesus died for me on the cross. He atoned for my sins. He can fully justify me by offering me the only justice which is acceptable in God's sight. For the first time in his life he really prayed, O oh God, be merciful unto me, a sinner. Lord Jesus, save me from hell. Falkening left the room quietly. He could go back home with his mind set at rest, because the dying man had called upon the name of the Lord. Three times in the Bible we find this verse. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. The next day, when Falkening came back to see him, he found a man at peace with God. How are you, Heinrich? he inquired. Jesus has accepted me by grace, was the answer. A miracle had happened. Now I'm going to tell you another story. I learned a learned Jew found Jesus one night and said to him, Master, I'd like to have a little talk with you about religious questions. But Jesus replied, There's nothing to discuss. Unless a man is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. What's that you say? exclaimed the visitor. I can't go back into my mother's womb and be born a second time. But Jesus held his ground and declared, Unless a man is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Here we have the strictly personal aspect of the Christian faith. The man or woman who wants to lay hold of eternal life must go through the narrow gate by being born again, through the mir miraculous action of the Holy Spirit. We are not talking theological subtleties here, no, your eternal lot is at stake. You may not have the chance of having a falconing at your bedside when you are at death door. So you would be wise to listen to what I have to say. To be born again implies that I have at last come to recognize that God is right, that I admit I am lost and that my heart is evil. To be born again requires that I acknowledge my need of Jesus, the world's only Savior. To be born again entails my making a forthright, honest confession of my sins. Lord, I have sinned against heaven and against you. To be born again also involves my making an act of faith. The blood of Jesus purifies me from all sin. He paid my debt and offers me the only justice acceptable in God's sight. To be born again calls for a total surrender of my life into the hands of Jesus. Finally, to be born again means that the Holy Spirit makes it clear to me that I am a child of God, or to use biblical term, terms, that God has put his seal upon me. Without the experience of this new birth, you will not enter the kingdom of God. The man or woman who has become a child of God can be absolutely certain of it. If I am drowning and someone pulls me out of the water, I know for certain that I have been saved when I feel the ground under my feet and when my breathing comes back to normal. Let me repeat this. This is a strictly personal aspect of the Christian faith. The new birth is an experience each one of us must go through personally if we want, to, if we want eternal life. Looking back at the way I became a child of God, I'm forced to admit that it was a real miracle. I was living far from God, committing all kinds of sins. But then Jesus came into my life and now I belong to him. I wish I could have ten lives to live in order to snatch men and women from everlasting damnation by bringing them to Jesus Christ. Have no rest until you are born again and can say, His forever, only His. Who the Lord and me shall part. Ah, with what, what a rest of bliss. Christ can fill the loving heart. Heaven and earth may fade and flee, firstborn light in gloom decline, but while God and I shall be, I am His and He is mine. The new birth is not the end of the Christian's experience, it is only the beginning. Throughout the Christian's entire life, his faith will have personal character to it. Right from the beginning of my Christian life, I knew I knew it. It was indispensable to listen every day to my friend's voice. So I started to read the Bible. Many people today seem to think that only pastors read the Bible. Not, not far from my house in Essen, there is a public park. 
That's where I like to go to read my Bible in the, in the morning, walking to and fro as I do so. People in the neighborhood sometimes watch me. One person said to me the other day, I see you're, you're reading your prayer book in the mornings. It's Roman Catholic priests, you know, who read their prayer book. The men could not imagine my reading a book that, in, that any ordinary person might also read. Contrary to general opinion, the Bible is a book for everybody. In the camps I organize for my group of young people in Essen, we gather together in the morning before breakfast for a 15-minute time of meditation. We begin by singing a hymn and then we look at uh, the day's reading in, in daily light. Afterwards, I suggest a passage of scriptures and everybody goes off to read it for himself in his own little corner. Those who have taken the first step of faith towards Jesus continue this practice at home because they cannot do without hearing the Good Shepherd's voice and talking to him. If you have decided to follow Jesus, be sure to cultivate the personal aspect of your faith by beginning to read the New Testament. Have your 15-minute quiet time every day, morning or evening. And when you have finished reading your New Testament, close your eyes to pray. Lord Jesus, now I have to talk to you. I've got so many things to do. Help me to get through them. Deliver me from my favorite sins. Give me love for others. Fill me with your spirit. Talk to Jesus. He is near and he can hear you. Prayer is also one of the private elements of the Christian faith. A while ago I said to a man who had uh, just been converted, you need to spend a quarter of an hour every day in the presence of Jesus. To this re he replied, Pastor Bush, I'm not a pastor like you. You have got time for that. I haven't. I've got a very tight daily schedule. Listen to me carefully, I said. You never manage to get through all your work, do you? No, he admitted, never. You see, I explained, that's because you don't put aside a time for prayer. If you took the habit of talking every day to Jesus, reading a few verses of the Bible methodically, followed by a moment of prayer, you would soon see that you can get through your work as if it were child's play. The more work you have, the more you will need that 15-minute quiet time. You may even need to stretch a quarter of an hour into half an hour in order to have enough time to bring all your preoccupations before the Lord. And you will see that things will get better. If I tell you this, it's because I've experienced, I've experienced the truth of it myself. Sometimes I've scarcely got a leg out of bed when the telephone rings. Then I go and get the paper at the front door. Then the phone rings again. Soon after that, someone comes for a visit. All, all day long, my nerves are on edge. Nothing goes right. Then suddenly I remember, why you haven't taken a minute off to talk to Jesus today? Or, and he hasn't had a chance to talk to you? No wonder things are going wrong. This time spent in the presence of Jesus is also one of the private aspects of the Christian life. Another one is what the Bible calls crucifying the flesh. In the course of my life I have walked to numerous men and women. Almost all of them have told me about their woes and grievances. Wives have complained about their husbands and husbands have complained about their wives. Parents have criticized their children and children have criticized their parents. But it never occurred to them that, that when they pointed a finger at someone else saying, it's his or her fault that I'm not happy. They were actually pointing three fingers at themselves. If you make a habit of uh, a praying, it will not be long before Jesus shows that you yourself are resp responsible for your woes. Your marital and family problems are due to the fact that you are not living in the presence of God. Things are not going right because you're not walking with God. The Christian must learn day after day to crucify his old nature. I would like to share with you a personal experience I had recently. Along with about 50 other people <coughs> working among the young people in Essen, I was able to attend a retreat of several days. It was wonderful, so wonderful that it was beyond description. We were all so happy to be together and God richly blessed us. In spite of this, there were some tensions. But the last day before celebrating the Lord's Supper together, one person after another could be seen getting up and going over to someone else and saying, Please forgive me for this or that. As for me, I had to go to three co-workers and say, Will you forgive me for speaking so harshly to you the other day? But you were right, replied one of them. Forgive me all the same, I implored. It is not easy for a man of my age to humble himself before a twenty-year-old, but I would have had no peace if I had not done so. 
If you form the habit of coming regularly into Jesus' presence, you will learn to crucify your old nature each day, and you will see that things will improve. This is one of the elements of the strictly personal side of uh, the Christian's faith. If you know nothing about this aspect of the Christian life, then I beg you, stop calling yourself a Christian. Often when I am walking along the street, I reason like this to myself. The people rushing past me in the street probably all consider themselves Christians. If I stop someone at random and ask, excuse me, are you a Christian? He would more than likely say, of course I am. You don't take me for a Muslim, do you? And if I continue to question him, tell me, have, have there ever been times that you haven't been able to sleep because of your joy of being a Christian? He would probably remark, are you crazy or what? Am I not right? Present day Christianity gets no joy at the thought of the faith it professes. We complain about the church and that's all. Not the slightest sign of joy, but from the moment we experience a miracle of the new birth, we understand the significance of his word from the Apostle Paul, Rejoice in the Lord always, I would say again, rejoice. Lately I read a magnificent pas passage in the Bible to my young people. For you who revere my name, the Son of Righteousness, a prophetic allusion to Jesus, will rise with healing in its wings. Isn't it beautiful? The text continues. And you will go out and leap like calves released from the stall. This passage puts it so beautiful, yet I rarely meet Christians who, in their joy at belonging to the Lord, jump like calves released from the stall. Why is it we don't feel this joy? Uh, the answer is simple. We are, we are not real Christians. I can't help thinking of my mother. Her deep joy in the Lord was visible to everyone. I have known many other Christians who, like her, were shining with joy. I hope that as the years go by, I too will come to feel the joy of the Lord more and more. This means taking the gospel seriously and not being satisfied with the thin veneer of Christianity. So much for the, th for the first side of uh, the Christian faith. It's strictly personal, but there is another side seen by all. The public aspect. First and foremost, Christian has fellowship with other believers. This is a very important point. The true Christian joins up with other Christians who, like him, are yearning for the full accomplishment of their salvation. There is a Sunday morning worship service, for example. Why don't you go? But I listen to the Sunday morning broadcast service, you may exclaim. Now, I'm not talking about the sick. For them, it is an excellent thing to be able to tune into a service of worship but if you don't feel like taking part in person in a real worship service, in a real gathering of believers, then your Christianity does not go very far. The Sunday worship service is an integral part of a genuine Christian life. Around the year 300 AD, a very long time ago, an extraordinary man by the name of Diocletian um, ruled over the Roman Empire. Formerly a slave, Diocletian had uh, progressively climbed up the social scale until at last he sat on the throne of the great Roman Empire. By that time, Christianity had permeated throughout the whole empire. The em emperor Diocletian knew, of course, that his predecessors had persecuted Christians. But he thought to himself, I won't be so stupid, I'm not going to persecute the best people in the empire. They can believe whatever they want under my rule. Everyone can freely choose his own religion. It was quite unusual for an emperor to have such a tolerant attitude. The world's rulers, in general, want to have control over our consciences. Now, Diocletian had taken as a close associate a certain Galerius, a former shepherd. He later succeeded Diocletian on the throne. One day Galerius said something like this to him, Diocletian, you'll see that when these Christians are in the majority, uh, there will be a lot of public unrest. They keep on talking about Jesus, their king. We have to do something to stop them. Come on, replied Diocletian. You are talking nonsense. For 250 years, my predecessors continually persecuted the Christians and never succeeded in stamping them out. As for me, I'd rather leave them alone. Diocletian had a lot of common sense, but Galerius went on nagging him. Those Christians are a strange lot, you know. They claim that they are filled with the Holy Spirit and that others are not. And they claim to be the only ones for whom salvation is available. They are proud people, and you would be wise to get rid of them. Diocletian continued to refuse. Galerius, on the other hand, was not easily defeated. So he came back again and again, until at last Diocletian gave in. Okay, 
but all we'll do is to prohibit the Christians from meeting together. An edict was proclaimed to the effect that henceforth all Christians were forbidden to worship together under the penalty of death. They had the right to follow their own beliefs on a strictly personal basis, but not as a gathered group of believers. The elders met together to consider the situation. What should we do? Wouldn't it be wiser to simply, wouldn't it be wiser simply to obey? After all, uh, we can do what we want behind the walls of our homes. Nobody will lay a finger on us at, at home. Uh, the, the conclusion is highly instructive. Meeting together for prayer, singing, preaching, instruction, and giving of our tithe is an integral part of our Christian faith. We shall continue as before. And they continue to meet in their churches. Galerius excited, you see, Diocletian, he said, those Christians are enemies of the state. They will not submit. And he launched one of the most cruel persecutions that the Christians had known up to that time. Many Christians submitted, thinking, we can stay at home and still be Christians, we won't go to the meetings anymore. But this was not the opinion of the Christian church in general. Those people are apostates, it declared, and the man and woman who ceases to attend Christian assemblies is considered as an apostate. We should be saying the same thing to Christians of our generation. There are indeed a great number of apostates in present-day Christianity. The Christians of that period were totally right in opposing their imperial edict, for the Bible clearly says, let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing. Nowadays we might say, as almost everybody is in the habit of doing. That is why I insist that those who earnestly want to be Christians ought to join an assembly of believers. There are different ways for believers to meet together. There are regular church meetings, Bible studies in private homes, prayer cells, youth groups. I beg you to get in contact with other Christians. A Frenchman said to me one day, some people like to eat herrings, others like to go to church. Sorry, but that's simply not true. It is far more serious than that. Some people are on their way to hell. Others look for fellowship of other believers. That is a matter of fact. If you are really serious about living as a disciple of Jesus Christ, then you must make some effort to find a group to join where you can learn more about Jesus. This is very important. You must go only where they talk about Jesus. No one can say in my area there is nothing. People who love the Lord Jesus can be found everywhere. They may not be numerous, and they may even be a little strange, but it, that doesn't matter. Your Christian faith is a dead faith if you do not have fellowship with other believers. A Christian service of praise consists of at least four things, singing, teaching, prayer, and offering. They should be a part of every meeting. This was a practice of the early Christians, and that's how every Christian's God-given new life should be expressed. There's only one type of Christian faith. It's a kind that finds its expression in the fellowship of other believers. The Bible goes so far as to say, We know that we have passed from death to life, because we love our brothers this verse implies the person who is not attracted to other Christians is spiritually dead. I shall never forget um, the extraordinary beginnings of my ministry at Bielefeld, where I was an assistant minister in one of the districts of the city. There were only a handful of us on the Sunday morning services, which were held in the local parish hall. One Saturday night, God allowed me to have a long discussion at the house of people, a, a communist-owned hall, with uh, some militants and free thinkers. It lasted until one o'clock in the morning when the bartender finally put us all out, out of the door. It was raining outside. I managed for the first time to gather around me an audience of about a hundred men, all factory workers in my area. We formed a circle under a street light. The men asked me questions and I answered them. We spoke about Jesus and about his coming into this world. After a while, they came to the point where they were honest enough to admit they were unhappy. They were only fooling themselves and claiming not to have sinned, that deep down they really believed in the eternity and in the coming judgment of God. Around two o'clock in the morning, I finally said to them, Now, my friends, it's time for me to go home. In the morning, I'm holding a church, church service at 9.30. I'm certain you'd all like to come, if you weren't so scared of each other. Just in front of me was um, a worker whom I will call B., at the time, he must have been around 35. He was a real Westphalian. Who, me, he asked? Scared? Not on your life. Okay, okay, I replied. Don't get excited. But if you do go to church on Sunday, you'll get a lot of remarks from at work on Monday morning, won't you? And that's what you're all afraid of. Second time, he said, no, I'm not scared. And the second, one, second 
And the second time I said, come on now, you'd like to come, but all right, I'll be there tomorrow morning with a hymn book under my arm. And that Sunday morning, only a few hours later, who should come strolling down the street, a hymn book tucked under his arm, and walked right into our hall. But this good old Westphalian, he was well known in the district. Monday evening he came to see me and said, you were right, my pulse at the factory really mad at me for going to church. But I've seen through the bluff of our propaganda. We cry, long live liberty, but actually we are slaves of other men. I've thrown everything overboard, including the old book of free thought. Now tell me about Jesus, I want to know more about him. He was my first convert, and it all started because one Sunday morning he attended the worship service over our humble little body of believers. He persevered, and other, others followed his example. A breach had been made. As time went by, God continued to work among us, but the thing that's, that struck me most at the time was the fact that the turning point for these workers arrived when they started attending our meetings, and they came under the influence of Christian fellowship and teaching. I beg you, for the sake of your soul and your eternal salvation, get in touch with other believers. I am not campaigning for any specific church or any particular preacher. My first and foremost concern is the salvation of your soul. Then, too, every Christian is called upon publicly to confess what he has found in Jesus. And this is the second aspect of the open, visible side of the Christian faith. Have you ever witnessed to Jesus Christ, if only by remarks like this, <clears throat> it's true, Jesus is alive, or... You are insulting the name of the name I love above all by all your blasphemies, or with your obscene stories you are dragging one of the greatest marvels of God's creation into the mud. Have you ever testified to him simply by saying, uh, I belong to Jesus, or people just wouldn't believe their ears if we all started witnessing? As long as we don't have the courage to talk to others about our Savior, we are not true Christians. Jesus said, whoever acknowledges me before men, I will also acknowledge him before my Father in heaven. But whoever disowns me before men, I will disown him before my Father in heaven. It will be tragic on the judgment day to see so-called Christians stand up and say, Lord Jesus, we believed in you. And to see Jesus turn to, to his Father and exclaim, I never knew them. But Lord, I was really, I don't know you would be the reply. Your neighbor never knew he was going straight to hell. You never warned him, even though you yourself knew the way leading to eternal life. Every time you ought to have opened your mouth and taken a stand for me, you remained silent. I know, but my face was so weak. You ought to have confessed even that weak faith. A weak faith still is a powerful savior. Anyway, I never ask you to proclaim your faith, uh, but to proclaim me. I do not know you. Whoever acknowledges me before men, I will also acknowledge bef him before my Father in heaven. But whoever disowns me before men, I will also disown before my Father in heaven. That is what Jesus said, and Jesus never lies. When we will get the courage to open our mouth and acknowledge him. I must tell you another story. I was speaking a few weeks ago in one of the cities of the Ruhr Valley. The meetings had been organized by a young friend of mine, Gustav. Gustav is the head of the repair shop of one of the city's largest garages. He has become a joyful and effective witness of Jesus Christ because he learned to take a stand for his Savior at the right time. One Monday morning in the shop, each worker, one after the other, began bragging about his Sunday exploit. One of them said, We were so drunk that the beer came running out of our eyes. Another fellow described in detail the adventures with the opposite sex. And you, Gustav, they ask, where were you? At the time he was still an apprentice mechanic. In the morning, he replied, I went to church. In the afternoon, I went to Pastor Bush's young people's meeting at the Weigler House. Then followed a regular round of teasing and mocking. And the young apprentice stood there, crestfallen. But suddenly, while everyone, apprentices, mechanics, and even the foreman was attacking him, a hot anger surged up within him. Why is it, he thought, that among people who call themselves Christians it is possible to boast about the most shameful things, but it's not possible to take a stand for the Savior. He determined then that there is uh, to endeavor that he determined then and there to endeavor to win the whole shop to Jesus Christ. Beginning with his fellow fellow apprentices, he took each one aside in private and said, Listen, if you go on like that, you will end up in hell one day. Why not come with me next Sunday to the young people's meeting at the Weigler House? You will hear all about uh, the Lord Jesus there. By the time Gustav left the shop after having successfully passed his mastership uh, exams, things had totally changed. 
I witnessed this for myself. All the apprentices belong to my group of young people. Three of the mechanics went to the, the meetings at the YMCA. In the shop, nobody dared to make any obscene remarks any longer. When a newcomer would start to talk smut, the others would signal to him to be quiet. While someone would whisper in his ear, shut up, Gustav might hear you. And so Gustav gained uh, everyone's respect. Today he has a very responsible position as head mechanic in an important garage. God has clearly blessed him in every way. Once again I repeat my question, where are the Christians today with the courage to speak out publicly and to publicly declare themselves for their Savior? Yet it is only as we confess Christ that we grow spiritually. Is the Christian faith a strictly private affair? No, it's not. We have an obligation towards the world to testify to our faith in Jesus Christ. So put an end to your contemptible silence, otherwise Jesus will disown you on Judgment Day. During the Third Reich, a good number of my young people, all teenagers, were enrolled by force in Hitler's Arbeitsdienst, or labor force. Shortly before their departure, I gave each one a small Bible with this recommendation. When you have joined your unit on the very first evening, lay your Bible on the table, open it and read it in the sight of everybody. This will be like a bombshell, but the next day it will be over. You don't take your stand right at the start, you will never do it. They did what I suggested. They put their Bibles on the table the very first day. Uh, what are you reading there? The Bible. If a hand grenade had exploded in the room, the reaction would not have, could not have been worse. Sad to say, in our German society, you may read any kind of dirty book, but not the Bible. One of my young friends, Paul, he did not come back from the war, discovered the next morning on opening his locker that his Bible had disappeared. He looked around the room. One of the boys burst out laughing. The others joined in. Did you pinch my Bible? He asked. Hmm, was a reaction. Where did he put my Bible? He insisted the sergeant's majors got it. Paul knew then that things were going to be tough. When he had finished his chores that night, he looked for a spot where he could uh, be alone and prayed. Lord Jesus, I'm alone. I'm only 17 years old. Please don't let me down. Help me to take a stand for you. When he had finished praying, he went uh, to the sergeant major's office and knocked on the door. Come in. The sergeant major was sitting at his desk. And there on his, on his desk was Paul's Bible. What do you want? Please, sir, Paul implored, give me my Bible back. It's mine. Hmm, was the only reply. He picked up the Bible and started leafing through it. So it's to you this Bible belongs, he remarked. Don't you know the Bible is a dangerous book? Yes, sir, I know it is. It's a dangerous book. Even locked up in my locker, it stirs up trouble even there. The officer straightened himself up in, in his chair and said, Sit down a minute. Then he blurted out, At one time, when I was younger, I planned to study theology. Paul asked, Sir, have you denied your faith? A deep conversation then followed, during which the sergeant major, a man of about 40, admitted to the 17-year-old, Actually, I'm a very unhappy man, but I can't go back. The price is far too high. Poor man, said Paul. But Jesus is well worth all the sacrifices. The officer dismissed the youngster with these words. You are fortunate, lad, my boy. You are right, sir, agreed Paul, as he walked out of the office with his Bible tucked, um, tucked under his arm. From then on, no one ever made the slightest remark about his Bible. Where are the Christians today who have the courage to stand up for their convictions? Is the Christian faith a strictly personal matter? Yes, it is. The new birth and the Christian life take place in the depths of the believer's heart. Is the Christian faith a strictly personal matter? No, it is not. Christians unite in church to worship God together. Together they participate in home Bible studies, young people's meetings, and fellowship groups. They open their mouth and publicly declare that they follow the Lord. The world must see that God has lit a fire on earth in the person of Jesus Christ.